Good evening, everyone. Um, this is our meeting for the Neighborhood Improvement Services Advisory Committee. I'd like to welcome you to our meeting tonight, those who are watching on there, on air, and those that are here tonight. And I would like to call this meeting of the Neighborhood Improvement Services Advisory Committee to order. I would also like to thank our viewing audience for tuning in. And I would like uh, Ms. Paula to lead us in invocation. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for waking us up this morning and starting us on our way. We thank you for your grace and mercy and all the blessings that you continue to place upon us. Lord, we ask, I ask you to make sure that whatever we say, whatever we do is for the good of the citizens of Jacksonville, North Carolina. We love you, we praise you, we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Um, thank you so much. At this time, I'd like to welcome and introduce um, the members who go around the table and the staff. And also, we do have um, a city manager here with us tonight who will introduce yourself, and we'll go around the room so everyone can introduce themselves. Uh, I'm Brian Jackson, Jacksonville City Council, and committee liaison. Gloria Whitney, member. Jerry March, member. Pamela Trafton, Neighborhood Improvement Services Coordinator. Tracy Jackson, Director of Neighborhood Improvement Services. Jonathan Pyle, member. Paula Jones, member. Marsha Wright, member. Great, and I'm Will Smith, the chair. Louise Griggs, concerned citizen. Yes, ma'am. Josh Wright, city manager, recently moved here. Um, about a month and a half, excited to be here and just wanted to come by and introduce myself to the board and to thank you for being active community members and being part of our team. So thank you so much for taking the time to serve and to make positive things happen. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Has everyone had an opportunity um, to review the agenda? And are there any additions, changes to the agenda? No changes Mr. on Chair, it. Oh, yes, sir. Mr. Chair, I would move that we adopt the agenda as written. Thank you. Yes, Thank you very much. And for all in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. The motion is carried. Um, the minutes of August 22nd meeting have been provided for your review. Has everyone had an opportunity to review those minutes? Mm -hmm. Make a motion to adopt the minutes of approval. Second a motion. Great. 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 Of all in favor say aye. Aye. Okay, the motion is carried. Okay, and um, at this point we will um, go beyond our planning board update. Mr. Steve is not here tonight. We'll go to our community development at this time. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. We are here again to give a update in the world of what's going on in community development. Um, we're going to go over the CDBG funding, CARES Act, the annual action plan, plan the annual action plan planning process, CD projects, and the town center update. Currently, we have in our status for CDBG funding in the CARES Act, we processed 722 applications. We processed over almost 300 Households have been funded, total of $130,000 approximately have been spent, and we have about $10,000 left in the $530,000 that was allocated to us. So we are ahead of schedule of having half that money spent by 2023 um, in December. Uh, we have already planned to set up um, our public input meeting during that planning process. So the next in public input meeting will be held November the 15th. And also we have two more scheduled in, in January and also in March, ending with a, another public input meeting in April of 2023. Can I say something like that for the public input meeting? Um, for those, if our staff can get together and make sure we're at these meetings so we can help run those meetings and actually um, know what the input is from the citizens 
um, we come in with some input uh, from the citizen if we can kind of um, help them out to actually know what this means for our city and how important it is um, for them to have input uh, because I believe if um, they have input, they'll be more vested to know what's going on and to help the city actually spend that money. So if we can um, sign up to say, hey, we'll be there um, and RSVP early so we'll know. Thank you very much. Yes. To um, piggyback with uh, what Bishop Smith said, the first public input meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, November 15th at 6 p.m. It's going to be held at the Sandy Run Missionary Baptist Church on Hargett Street. We do encourage members of the Neighborhood Improvement Services Advisory Committee to lead that meeting. And we look forward to having you there, as in the past, uh, we've had quite a showing when you all invite folks to come and when you all lead the meeting, uh, because it's supposed to be input from the community and you all are all part of the community. So yes, please let us know if you'll be able to serve during that time on that night. I also wanted to talk about the CD projects. Of course, we have been investing quite a few of our CDBG dollars in the Country Club Villas neighborhood. Um, this is two of the worst looking structures that um, were in um, Country Club Villas. And at 427 and 429, we purchased and now we are renovating those two structures. So here we have a current status of the renovations that have occurred at the Myrtle Woods Circle um, um, homes. They're gonna be for sale, um, especially 427. We're going through the final walkthrough with that. And just wanted to show you that this is what these structures look like in the rear, as I said. One of the worst conditions um, structure that was in that neighborhood, and now we have turned that around to where we have a nice home for sale in that neighborhood. Um, that neighborhood has turned the corner, um, and we're very proud of the efforts that we have um, put into that, along with the resources. Like I said, 427 Murderwood, is, it is for sale, completely gutted and renovated nice new construction materials ready for a family to come in and purchase. And Pamela Tracton, mm -hmm. she is going to tell us um, later on how someone can qualify to purchase those homes. So with our demolition, make sure I'm following up here. Um, we've constructed over a hundred and oh, a hundred and sixty units that we've demolished so far, and this was our most recent one that was complete. We do have one coming up on Bell Fork that will be the next one taking place, that will put us at one hundred and sixty-one going into the end of the year. Um, for our demolition process, if you are interested in finding out how the demolition process works specifically. We look at it from a voluntary standpoint or from an involuntary standpoint. Voluntary standpoint would be the matter of the homeowner approaching the city asking for assistance in tearing down the property. After we do our due diligence and investigation to see if we are able to demolish the property, the homeowner would qualify for a grant as long as the home does not fall within the floodplains or there's not anything that it has to be a vacant structure for us to be able to utilize it. Involuntary usually comes through our code enforcement case where we've reached out to the homeowners on a voluntary standpoint. They're non-responsive to our efforts and code enforcement then goes and takes the process further to where it goes before city council and city council at that point gives us the permission to move forward on the property. Our nonprofit executive roundtable, the last one we have coming up for this year is November 16th. We have the Vice President for Public Policy and Advocacy, Mr. David Heinen, being our guest speaker. It will take place at Coastal Carolina Community College. This is very imperative for our nonprofits, primarily because we're in an election year and some of the 
bills that are out there and potential laws will have an impact to our nonprofits. And those are some of the topics that David is going to come down and speak to us specifically about. It is a free class. Lunch is provided. However, you must register at jacksonvillenc.gov backslash nonprofits. I would certainly recommend to anyone who's interested to participate in those. They're always very, very good yes. and uh, very, very informative. And I was on the board for the North Carolina Center for Nonprofits when we hired David. And it was really the best money we ever spent, to tell you the truth. And uh, so any of you who are, they're very, they're not short, but they're just long enough. <laughs> they're right in the middle of the day. <laughs> and uh, I would recommend anybody to uh, tune in. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Um, our last classes that we have for the 2022 calendar year. First up is money management, which will take place on December 3rd. This is a free class from 9 to 12. The focus is placed on budget, credit score repairs, um, financials, handling your wallet. Um, it is a 9 to 12 free class. So that kind of helps you in the financial planning because it is a free class. Uh, registration is required. And when you're registered for money management or home buyer education course, you're going to call 910-938-5286. The home buyer's education course class is coming up next Saturday, November 5th. This class is from 8 to 5. And it is $25 per person. Lunch is provided as well as a continental breakfast. The great portion of this class, the home buyer's education course, is your first step in becoming a homeowner. Even if you have just an inkling of an idea that you want to own a home, your next goal is to come into a home buyer's education course. Once you've gone through the class, you'll hear from other professionals that talk about how to go through the process with a realtor, how to work with a lender, how to work with a financial consultant, home inspector. We've partnered with NC Works as well as Habitat for Humanity that also identifies the different programs that they have in relation to becoming a homeowner. Once you've gone through the class, you have an opportunity to then do a one-on-one -on -one counseling session with myself. That then allows us to look at your credit to see where you're at on a credit score. And we also look at your finances. If you're not currently at the point where you're able to purchase a home, we help get you to that point. And once we've gotten you to that point, you will become a new homeowner that is getting ready to see your house become built from the ground up. So 208 Queens Road, this new homeowner has went through the home buyer's education class, and now they are in the process of having their home built on one of the CD lots that we own. And we will have a new homeowner for the end of the year, beginning of next year. Now we have other opportunities available for home ownership. Our first one is 516 Myrtlewood Circle. And that one is currently on the market at three bedrooms, one and a half baths for 120,000. We are looking for the homeowner that the potential homeowner must go through the class as well. So that is the first step, regardless which process you go through. The great thing about our townhomes with 516 Myrtlewood Circle, 427 Myrtlewood Circle, and 429 that's currently under construction, all three of those are financed through the city of Jacksonville. So we have special financing options that is not available through the private sector. One of the biggest things is the interest rate. We're not advertising at the same interest rate. We're a whole lot less than what the current market is. So, but we definitely need that person that is looking to become a homeowner. We are looking for neighborhood revitalization and stabilization. So one of the requirements is you have to live here at least 10 years. So we want the next homeowner to come on board and sign up for the class November 5th and take a look at brand new everything. Everything that you saw in 427, maximize that in, 4, 6, in 516, and you'll see that in 429 as well. So wanted to um, also talk about Town Center. Town Center, uh, the owners of Town Center have begun renovation 
in several of their apartments. And their, uh, the renovations are taking place by the, um, I guess the Sanders, old Sanders Ford in that area. So progress have been made. Um, if you want to ride by there, I, I, I took a ride by there and they do look um, much better than they did um, as far as the um, past conditions that they were in. So I think they are um, going in the right direction, getting those renovations done. And we just had a city council meeting where they had to get some special permissions on uh, renovation of some affordable units. Units, And I'll let Councilman Jackson um, talk about that. Yeah, um, you know, there's a certain set of setbacks that we have um, based on the uh, city code. And we were able to grandfather, it's, I think it's gonna be a community at town center as we go forward, so that community investment group could basically save 130 units, which they said they would dedicate towards uh, income-based housing. So you know, a lot of people were concerned about the people were there at town center. Unfortunately, a lot of people got scared and started moving without actually knowing what was going on. And there were some changes in who they had managing the front office to, which was a problem before. But I think they're going in the right direction. And it's going to be about 20%, almost 20% of the apartments there will be uh, uh, income-based. And hopefully we can go forward to actually try to mitigate some of the issues we have with um, income-based housing in the city, because they say we're like 1,500, and I could believe if that's what is said, it's probably more than that. Could be 2,000 in terms of what we're lacking in our inventory with income-based housing. And I always say income-based because people say affordable housing, housing, and that gets mixed up with everybody wants affordable housing. So, but we, we need more income-based housing formally called low-income housing, but it's income-based. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I got a question when it comes to that. Um, and maybe it's not the forum, but it's just to put it out there so if you, know, you can answer it, maybe the city council. Is there some program or some, some type of um, initiative that, say, for instance, a new community development firm came in and said, hey, I'm going to build some, um, you know, 300 um, units over here. So, and you... City of Jacksonville says, hey, if you put 20% of those, then I, I brought that up in conversation. That's something we're going to have to figure out. You know, some places has tax incentives. Or yeah. Currently, we can't do that. But we need to try to figure out something. So, and there might be programs working with uh, Tracy and Pam to help figure out how we can create that. Because that would be, that. that's what I would love to see and others would love to see okay. is that we have more of a mixed-use housing going forward. Mm -hmm. So there would be some kind of set-aside of some kind. I just don't know what that could be no, at this point. Is. So, Do you miss Tracy? Well, I do know that the New River area um, is designated as an opportunity zone. And with that area comes benefits such as capital gains mm -hmm. um, gets deferred. And also um, there are some incentives as far as tax credits. Okay. So there can they can apply for those incentives to help alleviate the costs that they know that's not coming back because these are low lower income payers. So many many developers they know about those tax credits, but they have to be designated um, as those type of developers. A nonprofit developer uh, will have access to that or. Um, it could be a for-profit developer, but they have to apply for that designation. So you have to be, you know, knowledgeable in this kind of world of development for the low-income affordable housing market and able to be able to still make a profit and not, you know, lose money on a development. So um, there are a lot of, a lot of. Um, restrictions and requirements that you know you have to qualify for and, and i guess that brings me to the following question you know since we're already talking about you know improving our city improving our neighborhood um like i remember hearing that there were initiatives to bring um different um corporations you know developers to this area um 
to help, you know, so so much pressure wouldn't be on people, I gotta get a job here. That's the only way I'm gonna be able to survive in Jacksonville, where I can be on the local market um, and support myself, whether it be, you know, whatever the housing situation is. And those companies, do we have that program to recruit people to come here and build their warehouses, build their distribution centers, is it, or is it the same thing? It's yes, there. that's the yeah. opportunity zones. You can right. bring housing and industry and jobs in that area and build and have those incentives. Okay. Now, have we ever had any um, round tables to bring you know, sent out to these folks to but bring them in. We, we have John Jacksonville Oslo Economic Development. So that's the only thing? Yeah, that's really okay. the only thing we've had in place to go out there. And uh, Mark Sutherland and his group, they go out and constantly try to uh, recruit okay. people into the community, organizations, uh, businesses. And, and maybe that's something like for early next year we can talk through to see if they can come in and give the, you know, our, you know, our, our community say, hey, this is what we're doing to bring um, economic empowerment here to Jacksonville, Nazo County. So the people will know also what the city's doing, um, you know, get to, jobs um, towards that, to get jobs in there. And one of the other things, I, I think they actually are working, we're working on trying to get base access to a railroad, uh, a, a, well, access to the railroad that goes to the base. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, and that, I don't know where that is at this current time, but it was, last time I heard that it was finally almost in process, you know, and I think it's been over 10 years, yeah. but they were working on that. And we're waiting for DOD to actually make some decisions. I don't know exactly where they are, but I think it's, it's in a place where it looks like it's going to move forward. So. Okay. Most definitely to help the materials get from Port right. into Jacksonville. Uh, okay. Uh, and keep in mind, when we're thinking about so, that, don't take work from our local trucking industries also, because we have a lot of local so, um, mm -hmm. trucking industry people here mm -hmm. um, that can also get contracted in and do that work mm -hmm. because, also. Yeah, it's just about making sure information is available because that will open up a whole lot more, yeah. you know, uh, opportunities yeah. if we can And like I said, we can just talk about yeah, it, you know, early next year, bring a group together, yeah, so. We talk about, talk to Mark Sutherland about bringing him to one of the meetings. Yeah. I think that would be great. I've got a question for Pam. Yeah, yes, ma'am. Please. The, uh, the demo houses that you were talking about, when you go in and the owner gives you a right to demo the house or something, does the city buy the house? No, ma'am. We just do the How demolition. How does the process work? They're just giving us permission to, to access to the property. Yes, ma'am. So if a person wanted to put another house, because I see a lot of vacant space where you tear it down, there's nothing going back in. Is there anything going back in the space that you demoed out? I can tell you that we demoed a house on Hargett Street for mm -hmm. an owner. And um, I think after a certain um, amount of time, I think about five years passed, and it was a vacant lot. And then all of a sudden, we saw some building of that owner building their house on that lot. Okay. So it all depends on whether or not they can afford to put back a house, whether okay. or not you know they have financing. But it is up to the owner to decide to put a house back. Uh, a in house that or anything, just yeah. don't let it sit vacant because you go around the city, you see there's just slabs because behind the McDonald's where they tore down that old building that used to be That's the meat place, yeah, it's we, just grown up into dog weeds now. Well, we and the circle caves on the corner and over there looks like I don't know what. Our purpose is to eliminate slum and blight. So that's what we did with our CBG yeah, did money. That with the house, but, but they, the they owner grown up into weeds and trash and they have a, they have the opportunity to build and of course we can make them maintain it, but that's that's up but to the owner. Okay. That's, uh, but I just want to see that if you do there's a program that the city has to say, okay, well tear this down. We know it's not livable. Okay, it's come down. So here's the thing. And older people not going to the class, you say you gotta go to the class in order to buy it through the city or to get funding. So most of them would have to go someplace else to a lender to get that money. 
Oh, yeah, because that's their lot. That's the only way they could get it. Get an older person could get funding would be to go elsewhere because she's not, or he or she wouldn't be able to make it to the class. Well, keep in mind, we're not demolishing their primary structure. So these are houses that are already vacant. Nobody's living well, in somebody those. owns them, though. It's an right. asset for the owner. Mm -hmm. It's an asset for the owner. Oh, yeah. That's what right. I'm saying, because y'all did Lu Lu Lucille Armstrong house. And they built back. That's right at the end of Belfort Road where the freeway yeah, goes down. Yeah, she was living in her well, house. I know. And, and we replaced her house. These are vacant houses. And the one by Sanders Funeral Home. Uh, yeah, a lot of the houses I saw that you did tear down that was vacant. But what I'm saying is with the vacant ones, there's nothing. Something should be going back. No, we don't. We don't mandate the owners put a, a house back. No, not a house. I'm, I'm not saying that. It didn't have to be a house. Well, if it's not zoned for a it's certain. Just keep keep it looking like. Yeah. Don't let it look like Detroit used to. It all comes back to the owner what they want to do with it. Let pull the owner right. in. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Try to talk okay. to them through something. As, a, as an added point to that, I think that one of the major problems. It is, <clears throat> I remember hearing in one of our past meetings that one of the, the average income in Jacksonville is a little under $19,000 a year. And that is a staggeringly low number, unfortunately. And if you were to go ahead and sit down and do the math, that doesn't give anybody money, like people like you and me, because we can't put the responsibility on the city of building houses there. Right. You know, that's for the public and us to either buy, build, or... But if we don't have the money because we don't have the jobs, or our jobs that we do have aren't really keeping up with the economy and the inflation, uh, we're just going to fall behind again, and you're going to get those empty lots. So... I was listening about not only the, the housing that you can get some tax rebates and have to enter a certain program. I didn't know that that also included businesses because I feel like we do have to um, bring in more businesses and uh, foment competition within those businesses so that we can... Um, I mean, it's twenty twelve, about to be twenty twenty three, and nineteen thousand dollars. You know what I mean? There's twelve months in a year, so you're basically saying that a person's making about a thousand one hundred dollars a month, more or less. You know, and uh, when rent is seven to nine hundred dollars, that leaves you about two three hundred dollars to just make everything else work, and it's impossible. You know, and it's 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 keeping us impoverished in a certain way, in a certain sense. And unfortunately, the the rents and the cost of housing have gone up. Yeah. Even with this, uh, the new bill that we're doing, we found a unique situation where the builder had already had the materials, and that is the only way that this buyer could afford to purchase this house. Yeah. But even still, the cost of the house has gone up astronomically. astronomically. Yeah. It is, and it's going to take some special financing. It's going to take some layering of financing um, to make this homeowner, you know, be able to afford this house. So, you know, there are programs out there with our knowledge, skills, and abilities. We just, we what we're doing is we're trying to find other ways instead of doing the, um, the usual way of making the loans where we we find we find that we have to go outside and still inquire about is there anything else that we can use, you know, to make this program work. So Pam and I we we've been meeting with um people from North Carolina Housing Finance Agency, um, been meeting with lenders um, to see where we can come together and make, you know, home ownership a reality. Uh, we have been um, our programs have been stagnant because of COVID, now because of supply chain, now because of labor, now because of the interest rate is going up. So it, it, it never stops as far as trying to make our programs work, but that's what we're here to do. We're trying to make it work. And, and let me say this, you know, and um, I guess I'm becoming passionate too late in the game, you know, but um, 
one of the things that, that we find out, we got a lot of information, a lot of information, and we share it with each other and everything. But information on the shelf is just a book. Mm -hmm. But information applied, it can help these other things that we have going on, whether it's upward mobility, getting better um, jobs, better positions. Um, because just because I know it's a program, it's just a book. But when I apply it to my life now, I can uh, make a plan. I can plan out, hey, in five years, I'm going to do this. I'm going to cut back over here so I can get myself in a better position um, to, you know, move to a better housing community, you know, move to a loan, possibly. Um, and I think that's kind of where we at. And that's what uh, um, our neighborhood advisory um, services um, should be doing, you know, making not only information um, viable, but putting people to the test and challenging them use what we have. Um, and I'll just go back to the, um, the home buyers class and the um, money management mm -hmm. class. Um, two years ago, three years ago, <laughs> you can walk in that day and get 25 seats. Well, maybe not exaggerate a little bit. But now, you know, after testimonials and them seeing it, Hey, you better sign up early because these classes are going to be full. And these people who went through these programs, they went through the home buyers class, they went through the money management class, and they took the book, the knowledge on the shelf, and they applied it to their lives. And we see pictures of people moving into these houses. So that tells us it can be done. And so we have to move from always identifying the problem to actually being a solution based. Um, committee um, to help our city out, you know? And first, we do have to identify the problems, but we can't just identify them every single meeting. Some meetings are going to say, hey, this is the solution. Um, this is what we got to do. We got to rally around these people. So if it's one person um, that we're going to help in, in this next quarter, we're going to help them try to fool the capability and get them spun up on what they need to do to get to these classes, you know? Okay, I don't have the 25 bucks, you know. Hey, we have some other nonprofits, because I think I told you our church will give you how much ever, you know, for so many people who need to be in those classes, you know. Um, and we'll do that. And, and I think that's, you know, kind of the right way to go. Um, instead of us being here 10 years from now, still talking about same thing. Mm -hmm. the same thing, and we brought no upward mobility to our city. And that is our responsibility, along with it's our responsibility. <laughs> yeah, there you, go. Yeah, that's it. you know, and the, and the reason why I say that is because a lot of times what we'll do is we'll put some things um, um, that should be our responsibility on our elected officials, and we elect them to go and fight the battle for us to be our advocates. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we got to hold them accountable for what they told us they were going to do and what our needs are. So it's, a, it's kind of a two-way two -way thing. And so that's why it's, I think some of the goal is to get those people in, um, whether it's, you know, a, a quorum with our city council, or go to their meeting, we can go to their meeting, or get, what's the guy's name that we talked about a little bit earlier? Sutherland. Mark Sutherland. Mark Sutherland. Or get these different people in here yeah. so they can tell the community, this is what's going on and this is the direction um, that we're trying to go so we don't just stay kind of stagnant and you know um because yeah it, it gets kind of old you know um just going through this same thing over and over and over again and not only like you said uh keeping the elected officials accountable but also working with your elected officials supporting them yeah because they get their head out by themselves and get their neck cut off with by themselves i tell everybody i'm just one vote mm -hmm. but if you show up and you give the council, the understanding of why a certain issue needs to go a different direction, you know, it reaches them a lot of times. But if I'm just one person making that, uh, c conversing that issue and no one's in there supporting it, you know, sometimes they fall short. So That's right. uh, we're, we all have a duty out here, you know, we all have a duty. Right. It, is there a separate committee uh, dedicated to not only the house building, right, but the whole the, the job part of it so that we can pay for these houses? Or is it this committee that, you know, reaches out to 
I don't know. I mean, yeah, what we'll do bit bigger is, um, companies and says, hey, look, we got a lot out here, and you can put a factory out here, and you can. Well, that's what that's, that's, that's what Mr. Sutherland is doing. That's what I would develop. Yeah, he's trying to do that. Yeah. And they do their research with demographics mm -hmm. uh, from the census data, so that's why it's important. One thing leads into another. Right. Exactly. And we already <laughs> talked about the census when it was coming up. And we well, people, were, people don't understand how important this stuff is in exactly. every aspect of your life. Every aspect on bringing jobs here. Because if it looks like there's no one here, then why would a corporation come? Let me tell you something. Uh, yeah. I don't know who's familiar with Dave and Buster's. Is everybody yeah. familiar with Dave and Buster's? Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I talked to a cousin of mine, talked to the corporation about bringing the Dave and Buster's down here. And they didn't see how the numbers didn't make sense to them. But if you don't understand this market, you don't know why it could make sense, you know? So it's 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 not there are people out there out here that's trying to incubate businesses and um you know, actually bring businesses into the yeah. city. We, I think we need to diversify the type of businesses we have because we have so many go out and oh, eat. But, yeah. but, but there are people, like going back to it, if the numbers don't make sense to the, the big box company, yeah. it's yeah. not going to happen. And if, the, if they actually, uh, it's all a numbers game and figuring out. They don't understand that we have a captive market here called the United States military, the youngest city in America and stuff of that nature and don't see how Dave, Dave and Buster's, okay? And you know, the, it's family entertainment, but definitely that age group demographic will be covered in the entertainment there. And we've known in the past that a lot of our, our biggest, uh, our companies that actually, like Sears was the biggest producer in the country at one time. We had, I worked at a McDonald's was the biggest producer in the country. So because of that captive audience, we do. But until the other corporations mm -hmm. either can see that, despite some of the numbers they're seeing or figuring out a different way to do that, or, you know, because they are, like you said, it is diversified. You have people that actually go out and try to start businesses. Mm -hmm. But if they're, you know, uh, franchises and the franchise sir doesn't see it, then you, you can't bring it into your community. You know, and I know they have these already yeah. somewhere in our city. Uh, you know how you get the, the demographics and they give you all the breakdown, the median income and, and all those things, the numbers. But then there's um, an addendum to those pages, right, that speaks to specifically the audience of, the, of, the, of how many Marines we have here. And see, when we mention 40,000 Marines, we forget that half of those guys are married with probably right. two or three right. kids. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we have to start adding together that addendum okay. because uh, we were bringing a business venture here and then we showed them, hey, listen, this is what Jacksonville had. I know you don't want to come here because of that. But look at this other piece. They said, we didn't know about that. And I can't say, we have, like I said, bringing Mark Sutherland here probably clear up a whole lot of yeah. issues concerning what you're saying. And also, he could probably he could take stuff back to, yeah. into consideration. But I'm sure that he, and it's probably a frustration of his, yeah. uh, understanding that he was here he, 30 years in the Marine Corps himself. Mm -hmm. So he's seen what works in Jacksonville. But uh, I think that would probably be the next yeah. best step to continue this conversation. And, yeah. and, and one of the things also, you know, just to kind of think about, um, first thing, when you live in a city like we live in, Right, and I'm gonna say something a little bit later that's gonna feed into this. We gotta understand, this is what we have. This is the hand we were dealt. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we could have moved, you know, <laughs> but we didn't, we're here. So this is the hand that we're dealt. So because it's the hand we're dealt, Jacksonville is a service-based community, and that's a, from the base to everybody that works here. So it's, it's our job to make what we have the best. That's right. Um, and so with that being said, so now we can't go out and say, hey, we're going to be like Wilmington or we're going to be like Raleigh. No, we're going to be the best Jacksonville we can be. And, and part of that is bringing up these ideas, you know, getting these folks in here. Um, so once again, we're vested into our city, no matter how long you've been here. You know, because I know people have been here a long time, but they're not vested into the city. Um, that's right. That's you know, right. so, and that's the whole key because when I believe in what we're doing, guess what I would do? I would put more than just my tax dollars here. I'll put my blood, sweat into this um, 
community also. And that's another thing is that not only, you know, you're talking about trying to bring in uh, businesses, you start incubating businesses here. You have a lot of people that retire here and they're relatively young. So there are opportunities <laughs> there when you're talking about somebody retiring at 40, 40? Not only 38. 40, 38, years, 40, yeah. or up to 50. You still yeah. talking about somebody relatively young, but we have to kind of encourage that somehow. Yeah. And Mark, I know we have talked about that. We have talked about, talk about uh, what we call makerspace, where you can actually create a business where you have all the stuff, like a, you might have a boardroom certain equipment, 3D printer or something like that, that you can actually use. There are places like that in the country um, that have those type of facilities there, but it has to, it has to make sense, you know, on numbers so, right. and support. So um, I just want to ask you one question. Everybody knows uh, Pete from Chick-fil-A, right? Mm -hmm. He owns three, four Chick-fil-A's around here, and he started with nothing up in Richland. And how couldn't we couldn't get him to come in and talk to us and tell him about the business? He owns the, he, look, Jackie Barton over there with a honey baked ham. Invite him in. And that's we'll, that's we'll, what I'm saying. You know, we got people right here. That's what I used to get mad at the city council and, because we grabbing up people we got to pay to come in and talk to us. We, we, we got a, people um, right here to tell us what to do. And we have a spot, you know, the one city, my city, our city moments. You invite them in, they can come do. You know, a little spiel. They can on, let us know about the business area. What needs, you know, they see more than we see. Exactly, yeah. I, I, for example, I don't know what the hurdles are for, uh, I have an idea, I have money, but I, from point A to point B being, my business is now open. You know, I don't know what those hurdles are. So I don't know what to suggest, in a sense, so that we can make point B um, more attractive to, to, the, the retiree that has some money and wants to build a business or to the big corporations. So I don't, I don't know exactly how to make it a honey pot for them. So that incentivizes them to, to build here or to start a business. But yeah, um, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me say this too. Also, you might want to look at doing this outside cause you want to, you want to recognize what your capacity is based on what Neighborhood Improvement Services Advisory Committee is. Yeah. And, and, community, advice, and community yeah. development. Yeah. So it might be other organizations we can work with that can actually do that. I, I've talked to a, actually a couple of people about trying to bring businesses together that you haven't seen actually in the, in the community. So we can have a further conversation about mm -hmm. how other organizations have able or individuals were able to start franchising or actually start their own business where they are. So, um, okay. but yeah. And that leads me, and, and all of that good conversation, right, that we just had, that showed me that everybody's still motivated. Remember last meeting I was talking about, uh, not necessarily a subcommittee, right? And sometimes what we do is we come in here and everybody got our individual thing that, hey, we're laser focused on, you know, hey, they need to get these trash cans off the street. Hey, they need to get these chickens out of these backyards. <laughs> Um, but two or three of us, you know, two of us, you know, hey, we have a specific thing. That's what we're reporting on when we come in this meeting. So we, we've identified the things around the city. So say, for instance, we have a town center and two, two or three people, they understand these are the updates for town center because either they're part of a subcommittee or they're doing their research with the city or the city council, and this is where we're going. Um, and, and so now we can have a couple people, hey, boom, this is where we're at. Um, you know, two people, hey, we're bringing in, what's his name? Steve. Steve. Mark Sutherland. Mark Sutherland. We're bringing Mark Sutherland, and hey, this is what he's going to talk about real quick. Um, and so now we've covered down and we're ta a little bit task oriented, but not real stringent because we're volunteer, right? Um, just task oriented so we can get more done and bring some viable solutions back to the citizens, you know, to make sure that we're going, you know, forward real good. If that's plausible and if that meets our objectives um, that we're supposed to be meeting according to our um, article. If that ordinance. makes sense, yes. ordinance, according to the ordinance, if that makes sense. And I don't know, I mean, 
Um, so that's something to think about. I'll put it out there again. Mm -hmm. And if we don't bring it up next time, I'm going to bring it up again. Well, I was thinking about something on the future agendas that mm -hmm. I think... Uh, that could help with that? Well, because there's space for global thinking and then there's space for the minutia of it. And uh, <laughs> I remember, we, we haven't ever done it in a way that... Uh, I don't know whether you were getting that to there on the agenda or not, but uh, the city, and I think the county has done it as well, had basically a uh, almost a half a day or a day long, I don't know if we did it on a weekend or what we did, uh, event over across the street at the um, conference center. We brought in the youth council and they served on it, you know, to bring their perspective and so on. And uh, let's see, there's so many things we need to be talking about and people we need to be talking to. Two. And I'm not sure who Mark works with, but th the community is much more diverse than even the, the chamber is reaching or any of those organizations. They really are. And they're people like you're talking about that have ideas about where they'd like to locate. You know, when I go past all these empty, vacant buildings that may mm -hmm. be solidly built are just empty right now, or, or just empty, that you don't always have to be building brand new. You know, there might be a, re, a, a avenue for someone who needs a space and to put something in, not to build something brand new. And there are resources out there. That. We have had there people out there to do that. To go into these vacant buildings and the building reuse program through the North Carolina Department of Commerce. Um, they have those kind of resources. All you have to do is show site control mm -hmm. before you start your business. Mm -hmm. uh, we helped. Uh, brood awakenings down here downtown. downtown. We helped the um, Onslow Child Development Center off of Gum Branch Road. Mm -hmm. They got a grant, and I think it's another business that ended up having a grant. But the caveat of that is, it's a grant, but you just have to create jobs. But Tracy, have you been able to do that recently? Oh, or because your staff is. The Depleted, have you been able to do that? No, we have not been able okay. to do that recently. That's a, that's we go back to once again. And it's a pass through. The last one that we did was through uh, Wingate Apartments. Okay. We, we worked with the reuse and, uh, and a grant, a pass through to get the road built for some apartments with the Department of Commerce. But that's the last grant that we worked with. And see, that's good information. Yeah. So but there is some there are some resources out there. You just have to show site control, and then you have to show that you're going to create jobs. Now these are not jobs for your family members. Exactly. These are jobs <laughs> that shows that it's going to be someone coming in and applying for mm -hmm. a job. And depending on how many people you employ, that's how much funding you're going to get. Nice. Well, but but so that information on, has to go from this room to, to the public. But also based on your staff currently, can you all still do that now? Um, it is very stretched. Yeah, very it difficult. is very difficult. I mean, once again, I've been talking about this right. for decades now. Is Here we go. the on, city Andrew. and the county need to stop whatever division they're talking about because they are oh, all. I think we're in a, you know, going in the right direction. I hope they are. Well. And we have a new city manager. Sit down and look at the budget because I know there's money there. There's always money to do what you want to do. So when people tell me there's no money, I want to hear that because there's always money to do what you want to do, if you want to do it, you'll find it. And if you can put one together for one or two people or just one person for the city and the county, split the difference, put the travel in there, the, the, the uh, benefits in there, and put a salary for a person who knows what they're doing. Mm -hmm. And I know it works because you know, for 35 years, I worked with a program that was under North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, and someone named Marsha, just like me, that was the only job she had up in Raleigh was hunting for grant money. And at any given time, Kate B. Reynolds, Reynolds mm -hmm. Grants, they're running four or five of them for multi-million dollars because the state is not doing everything they're doing with tax money. There's no way you can. So they're looking outside. Mm -hmm. But we used to have, I remember a couple of times across the street, we did a symposium or whatever word you want to call it, invite people in and discuss, not necessarily the public, but invite all these groups in, all these committees from the city and the county. And also your youth, your older people. I went to a conference in 
2019, just before COVID, and a gentleman from UNC Chapel Hill who was a data person, but he says, no sense in collecting data if you're not going to use it to drive what you do. 6,000 people every day turn 65 years old in the United States. I didn't say every week, oh, every month, God. every year. Oh, every God. day, 6,000 people turn 65 years old. This country is nowhere even in the vicinity of planning and getting ready for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw an article recently that was very interesting. The, the sector of the population that has really got a problem with this are older women. They do not have the income to keep their house up. The kids are gone. They're not coming home. He is deceased, maybe in assisted living. They had a regular, what you call, middle class family while they were young and middle aged. Spouse passes away. Paint goes undone. Plastering goes undone. Foundations go undone. Because she doesn't have any money. She's barely able to feed herself and try to stay at her oldest house because she can't afford to go in a, a, a seven or eight thousand dollar a month yeah. assisted living facility. There's no way. And there's no way to work with her. So you're talking about a person who just needs what, when I was growing up, what the boys in the neighborhood did. There was not an elderly woman in my neighborhood who could mow her lawn. They weren't having it. Those boys, including my brothers, got out and mowed her lawn. Her house got painted. I, with one of the girls, did all the babysitting. We had to wash windows. You did it in your house, and you go over to Miss Sally's house, and you washed her windows. You did her floors. You waxed them. All of that is gone. Mm -hmm. And so we have to figure out a way to deal with that, because if this population is aging as rapidly as he said, it won't matter what else we're talking about because you're going to have a huge portion of the population who is not able to function, not able to help themselves. And one way or the other, you're going to have to deal with that. And we're not even having that conversation. I mean, we're talking about bringing businesses in and things for young people, and those are all important. But um, the demographics and the, and the census data shows this, you know. And, and there, there's uh, some resources out there for those folks as far as the, um, if they are on Medicaid, Medicare, the HOP program, it's a new program. H-O-T. H-O-P. It's HOP. It's the HOP program. Um, if you are on Medicaid, Medicare, there's a resource of about $650 million mm -hmm. regional. And Onslow County is located in that region. And you have to go through your caseworker if to be able one. to... If you have one, and, and if you don't have one, and you get Medicaid, somebody helped you to apply. You had to go down to DSS, that's your caseworker, and they have to put you in that system in order for you to access that money. Okay. So it's Medicaid or Medicare or just Medicaid? I think it's Medicaid. Mm -hmm. I think it's Medicaid. Because Medicare, you get if you keep breathing until you're 65. Yeah. So, <laughs> so that's not a means test to get so in there. There's a means test to get in these other programs. And if you live in the city uh, limits, we have a program, a residential rehab program. Of course, you have to qualify based on your income. But there are some resources here in the city of Jacksonville, along with uh, weatherization with Coastal Community Action. Those are resources that you can access and you know to weatherize your house. Um, so if you have questions about repairing your home and you're elderly, just give us a call and we'll put you in the right direction, whether we can assist you or whether or not someone else um, in the area can assist you. But you're very right that all this information we've heard tonight so, needs to get out to the people who hear it. They're not watching this program right. because they're trying to figure That's out something problem, this right. evening. <laughs> Uh, they may not have TV or cable or whatever it is because things are on G10. I don't think if you don't have cable, I don't know if you can yeah. get G10. So you have all of this stuff that's standing in the way of people getting what it is they need to have. And that's a whole other topic about trying to get rid of the stuff that's standing in the way of people getting the help that they need to, uh, to have. Because eventually, if we keep breathing, we're all going to need it. Right. So it's self-serving if for no other reason that if you if you live long enough, you're going to have to figure out whether you can manage to stay in this house or you and if you don't have somebody told me the other day that 
they planted a $15,000 a month bill in front of her uh, for her father and what he was going through. I don't know who is, if you can do that, you must be printing in the basement. There's no way you can. <laughs> <laughs> you can. And you know, you have to be, who can possibly do the math on 15 times 12 and figure out where in God's name is this money coming from? Mm -hmm. And it's almost as if you, it sounds horrible to say it, but she said, uh, and she said it herself, that uh, the family, I mean, he passed away after two months of coughing this money up. But then it left his widow destitute. Destitute, because everything he had worked for and saved up so that they could live comfortably and she could live comfortably, she had to pay to a facility like this. So here she is. And what are we going to do with her? Mm -hmm. So oh, you can do all the planning you want to while you're young. Where does it go, you know, and what do we do about that? You know, so I would just, I was throwing that out for future agenda that maybe in the spring or the summer or something like this, just have some kind of a symposium where we just get all the people who could, who have anything to say about a list of topics that we have and get them in a room somewhere. And uh, we have to make a list of the topics that we feel uh, would be important. Well, I do know that the city, the new city manager, he is um, meeting with council to get priorities, to get um, some information so that he can know which direction the council wants to go. So if we give that to Councilman Jackson to take back to those meetings, um, maybe that will help them to also include that in the planning process um, and, um, with the city manager coming on board. We, we talked about doing some town hall meetings as well, so mm -hmm. where we actually come out into the community, different areas of the community. So, okay. So we actually have those conversations. Here we go. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I, I know the council was was interacting interacting with the the new city manager, with Mr. Ray. So I'm hoping that we'll be hearing from them soon on how uh, priorities will be met and and identified yes ma'am one question why can't we have uh maybe once every six months a town meeting to let people know what's available beside and what's on national night out that was when i was home i was thinking about well, let's just what you just said down. about the city has money on yeah. hop and you can get uh Hard of hearing, they can we, do that and everything. Well, we're going to we at should the have a meeting to let the people know. At the community input meetings that right. we have scheduled, we bring to. all those resources to those meetings. But the thing about it is, they think it's only for housing and stuff. And a lot of people say, well, I'm not trying to buy a house. I said, well, maybe they'll talk about, you know, something else other than housing. Okay. And with our New River Town says, with our community input meeting, it's talks, but that's what I'm saying. It's, it talks about, we, we bring activities that are eligible for CDBG money to be used for, not just for housing, for anything. I know, I know and we list those at the meeting. meeting. So if they come to our meetings, um, they will get a whole list of resources. We take all those resources. Last because. question. When you got housing and economics, you take bring in someone that has something with NC Works, Brian come in talking about the railroad and Put all this together in front of people, for people to understand, and that's why it would be a whole lot better. I'm saying. Yeah. Well, and one of the things too, Miss Gore, I think what what, um, and I don't want to speak over you, but one of the things we we put together a lot of things for community input. We got a lot of information out there, but what happens normally, and you said a little bit earlier, people won't show up to it, mm -hmm. they, or they can't go to it, and so that's not the that's not the um, that can't be the right answer um, because we got a lot of people doing a lot of work now. However, we got to get them there. We have to got we got to get them there. Whether we carpool, pick them up, take the information back to them, um, because once again, it's like I said earlier. There's a lot of information in this room, but it's sitting on a shelf, unusable because nobody will come and pick it up and then take it and use it. So, um, and like the community input meetings, I think the next one will be good and then the next one after that it'll be better because we'll be kind of inviting our peers to come out fans expand the meeting exactly and these meetings are expanded whoever want even this meeting here that's if you want to come that's why I come on down Ms. and this these meetings are televised they repeat it so even if they didn't hear 
tonight is going to be repeated. If anyone has any housing needs or anything like that, call us. Even if you live in the county, we'll give you another resource. If we can't help you, there's always someone that can help, you know, in, in situations. You know, all they have to do is call us here at 910-938-5286, and we will do everything we can to, you know, help them out. And, and now we get to our one city moment, which I think all of this was a one city one moment city that moment. we have. Well, well, Pamela, she has a special one city moment. All right, here we go. Yes. My Jacksonville Youth Council, so proud of the teens and the support that's given um, in an effort to bring an awareness to issues that take place within the schools. Um, this school year, so let me backtrack. The first JYC stance took place in June of last school year, and that was in regards to the school shooting that took place in Texas. After that school shooting, school shooting took place, having the title JYC stance was a broad enough name that we could continue to have an annual observance ceremony that would allow us to bring awareness to different events that plague the children in schools, community, and such forth. So it was supposed to be a proactive ceremony. Unfortunately, we had an instance that took place at the beginning of the school year that caused us to react again to the ceremony. So this one took place October 6th, and there's a few pictures on it. And this year we focus on bully awareness. Um, the partnership was with Stand Up and Be Heard, which they were in their eighth year of being a nonprofit the gentleman in the back in the blue shirt, he's actually the founder of Stand Up and Be Heard as he was a victim of bullying himself when he was a younger student at the age of 10. And his mom tells the story that at the age of 10 being bullied, he said, mom, we just can't leave it here in this house. We have to get the word out. We have to spread the message. And that's how the nonprofit came up of Stand Up and Be Heard. So we partnered with them. Um, Ms. Melissa Oakley is the um, Oslo County School Board member. She partnered with us as well and did a candlelight visual and read the names of those students that they knew that had committed suicide based off of bullying. Um, so it was a very powerful, impactful event, bringing the awareness. And October is Bully Awareness Month. So we are still in the awareness of bullying. And we had media out there, mm -hmm. and they covered um, pretty much most of the, the program. So thank you. Thank you for Great job. Mm -hmm. Great job. I really appreciate um, you know, everything um, that you guys do. Um, I, I really do. Sometimes we don't, and uh, you guys don't hear it enough, and this is a volunteer. Um, things, everything that Miss Tracy and uh, Miss Pamela do after hours, whether it's the um, helping someone, the um, youth council, you know, those are all volunteer. You guys coming here tonight is volunteer, so I really appreciate it, you know. And, uh, and you know, I want to just say thank you uh, because it really makes our city better. And um, um, we already, I think we got enough things down for future topics. Um, uh, and I think we got enough down there. But mm -hmm. just before we um, finish, I want to see if uh, man, um, you came and you listened. Did you have anything for us tonight? No, not tonight. I'll wait. Oh, you'll wait? Okay, I'll now wait. don't let it pile up to where it's too heavy to carry. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> yes, Thank do, you. do we have any questions or comments from the group? I sent a message out to Mark Sutherland and I'll let you know what he says about when you can come. Okay. okay, thank you. Okay, great, great, great. All right, um, these are the key dates. Okay. Yes, sir. So we have November 5th, our home buyer education class. Um, also, that will take place at the Center for Public Safety. Also on November 5th, we have a passport fair here at City Hall. So if you have not, if you do not have a passport or if you need to update your passport, that can be done here on November 5th. Our November meeting for youth council is on the 9th. City Hall will be closed on that Friday for Veterans Day. 
Um, our community input meetings on the 15th that will take place at Sandy Run Missionary Baptist Church. The start time for that is 6 p.m. Next slide, please. November 16th, our nonprofit executive roundtable. November 19th, we are participating in the holiday parade. If you are able to participate in the holiday parade and walk in the parade with us, we ask that you do. Um, let me know um, by next Monday so I can include you in the count. Um, November 24th through the 25th, City Hall is closed due to Thanksgiving. And then December 3rd is money management and December 7th is the youth council meeting. And then our next meeting will take place in December 19th. It is a change date due to Christmas. And then the remaining dates for this fiscal year to June 26th. Okay, great. <clears throat> All right. I think, um, do we have anything else? And if not, I would like to um, bring this meeting and call it adjourned. So moved. Motion. A motion and Second. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't hear. I was like, oh, yeah, I was like, yeah.